Um, yeah, we have some more um, questions coming in this week. And this is a very interesting one. <laughs> I will read it to you. Um, some clients I have keep falling asleep during treatments. I know that it matters as their energy body changes while sleeping. Um, which layers of the energy body stay active or become active while sleeping and which are switched off? Is it okay that the client sleep or should I do something differently so people don't fall asleep? Well, that's an interesting one. <coughs> um, usually the, there, are, there are good sides and bad sides to it. The good side is that when people fall asleep, then apparently they feel safe, they feel at ease, they feel <coughs> that they can trust you. So that's a very positive sign when people can open up and relax and go more deeply. Um, and I, I tend to compare it a little bit with, uh, with the narcotic, um, like human operation, because in a way an energetic healing is very similar to performing a physical operation, physical surgery. And uh, on the one hand it is very easy if the person is asleep, um, because often what, um, what happens to the energy body is that part of the energy body goes to, uh, to the astral sphere, so part of the consciousness goes to the astral sphere and um, that means that the energy body which is left on the physical plane is actually lighter and easier to work with and there is no competition because there is no other will which will resist your treatment. So it is very easy to yeah, go more deeply and work more deeply while the person is asleep. Uh, the problem is that um, you have to do all the work because while the person's body is asleep then the energy body will it will not fight you but it tends also not to really work with you as it would when the client would be awake. Um, if the client is awake then you often uh, by doing things certain things can pop into the consciousness or people can uh, remember things or have certain feelings or give you feedback and this whole process of um, linking things to the past or linking one event to another event is something which doesn't happen when they are um, asleep. Um, one other option is also to uh, treat people on two levels. So to treat the astral body on an astral level while they are sleeping and treat the physical body on a more physical level also while they are sleeping. So it can also be used. But it is something to be really aware of and to actually try to make a, a choice in. Because some people tend to run away from problems or from realizations. Like, I don't want to know that I'm afraid or scared or angry. So instead of becoming afraid or angry or scared, they choose to go asleep. So that even during the treatment, these parts of them are not triggered. So they and we are playing hide and seek with, uh, uh, with the person who is giving the treatment. So one of the things you can do is to try to regulate the breath to prevent people from falling asleep. <clears throat> so what I, um, uh, if I want a person to stay conscious, then generally I will ask them to breathe to the spot which I'm treating. So if I'm treating the shoulder, I tell them like, okay, take your attention to your shoulder and breathe to my hand. And while they're doing that, also their life energy flows there, their attention flows there. And what is there slumbering gets more energy, gets more awakened and is able to transform. So it's also a little bit like if a person is conscious while you're performing surgery, they might fight you. But they can also provide a lot of feedback. They can tell you what is going on with them, whether it's hurting or it is not hurting. But yeah, it requires a lot more um, level of faith, a level of trust often, for a person to really face these issues together with, um, with the person who's doing the treatment. So often what I see is that in the first, like usually first one or two sessions, 
the client is too nervous because they don't know you yet and so they have to stay awake because they are kind of watchful and they feel that they need to protect themselves usually in some sessions after that they tend to surrender and to go to sleep and um, um, because they feel that they are safe but they're also still avoiding the deeper issues because they don't feel ready to deal with them yet and usually if the quality of the energy body and the life force is healthy enough then the person also feels safe enough to face issues and it's usually after the first yeah usually three or four treatments that people are really ready and it can sometimes take longer until the eighth treatment until people are ready really to go consciously into the really painful issues into really painful traumas with the person giving the treatments um, it's also uh, a very tricky thing because some people are in a way relaxing and thereby they allow themselves to be less critical to surrender more to the treatment but if the relaxation goes too much they fall asleep and it is important not to also prevent them from relaxing um, because the person needs to in a way go into a state where they feel safe and where they feel balanced but to be able to go into yeah the really confrontational healing state where they have to really grow and to work on themselves so generally in the beginning of the treatment i try to get them out of their head to stop thinking all the time to stop being critical to relax to go in a state of peace and before they sink too deeply into that so i often start with the meditation i will start the treatment and with the treatment i will sometimes ask them like um, what are you feeling or how are you doing or can you tell me what you see just to keep them conscious but still in the process okay excellent question um, hmm. so there's here a, a next question um, it is about panic and fear and chronic fatigue syndrome okay um, in a way chronic fatigue syndrome is kind of the, the opposite of panic and fear um, what you see is that um, when there is um, stress people can go uh, two ways. Some people are very uh, confrontational and they feel that they should take control over the situation and if they know everything, they control everything, they have everything planned then their level of fear can decrease. And these people go into um, yeah, uh, compulsive disorders, into neuroticism, desiring control, desiring power um, for instance also people who suffer from autism they need to know everything beforehand they need to plan everything before um, these are all um, ways of dealing of coping with uncertainty um, if there is unava unavailable coping strategies or people have no other way then often people go into panic or fear and it may sound very strange but actually panic or fear are avoidance mechanisms um, so it, they are methods to get you out of a situation and because if when you're in panic or when you're in fear you're not dealing with whatever is causing the panic or the fear outside of you you're completely self-absorbed you're just busy with yourself working with yourself and chronic fatigue syndrome is actually also a another method to remove yourself from a situation because you can't work you can't face it you're too tired um, chronic pain is also another way and chronic disease are also ways to remove yourself from unhealthy situations um, ultimately the the solution is to um, either change the situation or to change the personality structure so that the person experiences their situation in a different way but often a, a combination of the two methods is best <coughs> usually when a person is afraid they're not really afraid of what they think they're afraid of 
So some people are afraid of cats or spiders or uh, something like that or small spaces. But ultimately the fear is of a loss of control. And this lack of control can be symbolized by various things. So often people who are afraid of insects, insects they don't have um, our type of social communication. They have chemical communication but we can't smell it. But um, and this often shows that in a way the uh, situation is too mechanical, um, too inhuman, too abstract um, for the person to be at ease with. So often the people who have this fear of insects, they're more emotional people, more intuitive people, who feel it yeah, very hard or unnatural to deal with very rigid systems as there is often in, in office work or in contracts or administration. Um, so often if you can decrease the amount of bookkeeping or administration or other structures and increase the contact with animals or other things which are more in also on an instinctive or intuitive or an emotional level, then their level of um, fear will decrease. Mm. We also have the, the opposite, people who are afraid, for instance, from, of mice or of cats. Mm. And usually the, the fear of something furry is the, the fear of sensuality. Um, because the, uh, we react to our environment. Whatever is in our environment changes our energy body. And some people find it hard to stabilize themselves to stay themselves no matter what is around them, whether people are yelling loudly or there's music in the background or other things. And often people who need actually a very stable, quiet environment, um, they develop a fear of yeah, furry things. Um, and this is just a signal like, okay, I want to have a very quiet, calm, stable environment. Um, Chronic fatigue syndrome is often um, because people can't deal with their neuroticism anymore. Often the person will have, uh, in the first stage, a strong sense of duty or a very strong morality <coughs> of how things should be done or how things should be and what things should be like. And they will invest a lot of their own energy in arranging their life, their house has to be perfectly clean, their work has to be finished on time, other things have to be done perfectly. But all this energy is in a way flowing outward all the time. And because the core being is actually weakened, because it is tired, it gets more and more tired, more and more fatigued, the person feels there is less and less uh, security, because they feel that they grow weaker and weaker. But to compensate for this fear, they start to work harder and harder. And eventually this leads to burnout syndrome or chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, so it's very important that the people even learn how to feel good or safe, even though they have yeah, not a lot of energy and how to reinvest this energy into themselves instead of manifesting it outside of themselves. So often these people learn to manifest it outside of themselves by having a very um, yeah, big career or a lot of demands on their energy. So they might have children or a family who asks them to, yeah, to do a lot of things for them and they praise them. So it becomes very easy to live for others instead of to live for yourself. <clears throat> and chronic fatigue syndrome is in a way um, yeah, just an emergency measure or burnout which says like, okay, you've done too much for others. You really have to focus on living for yourself and also to um, learn to deal with the insecurities of life because you can't control everything in your life. And if there's this constant paranoia that things might go wrong and things will be bad and um, yeah, this creates like a constant stress, a constant strain um, but that's actually because of the feelings of insecurity and weakness that the person is experiencing internally. 
so often the person has to um, learn to, uh, to cope with their limitations and to feel okay with their own being imperfect or sinful or impure or uh, not living up to their own standards. And this is very difficult because these standards have often been incorporated very deeply into their personality and they've been kind of like the guideline by which they, they made all their decisions in their life. And it's very hard to try to, to decide in a very different way, to judge in a very different way. So these changes are not very quick to, uh, to come. Often it takes many years for a person to change on such a fundamental level that their personality becomes different and that they become yeah, either more relaxed again or but it also takes a few years for a person to shift in this position of yeah, being so stressed out. So these are slow processes and um, you cannot usually get very quick results in this and you should not be dissuaded because it's an up and down process. <clears throat> but yeah, ultimately working on security and also working on ways which don't cost a lot of energy but which do provide a lot of feelings of security. So get the person to ask for help, ask a, get the person to ask for support or um, do divination techniques like reading the tarot or um, things like this. <coughs> These are very simple methods so that the person can get some measure of control or some idea of what is going on in their lives without having to exert uh, control just by improving their sensitivity because that's in a way the flip side. If you use a lot of willpower then you control everything but everything has to come out of you and if you don't use a lot of willpower you can invite a lot of other people and other powers uh, into your life to guide you to help you so then you go more towards the mystical development if you can switch people from in a way magical to mystical then often you feel that the person yeah, can also relax more, have more faith and that there are other powers taking care of them. Then their stress level can decrease and they can get into a very different, more natural flow of things. Um, ah, yes. So there's a, uh, a sequel question to um, <coughs> To the last one that's uh, yeah people yeah experience a lot of fear and burnout and chronic fatigue and does this have to do with all the interstellar influences we've been getting for the past 14 years and the answer is yes um, because our energetic environment is changing much more rapidly than it was before and also the energies we are confronted with are very strange to most people and anything new causes more stress and also because there is more energy the impact of our environment on our energy bodies is also bigger so this is a, uh, a period where yeah panic uh, and uh, chronic fatigue and stress will uh, yeah are higher than than normal so we're just about yeah cresting the peak so the energy level will start to decrease um, but yeah, it is still above average, so people will continue to suffer from this for the next about 12 years. But also these extra energies also offer a lot of opportunities, but it is indeed very uh, tempting to go into fear and just to say like, okay, I'm just going to ignore everything, uh, but then you miss out on the whole purpose of um, what is happening and also why you are born in this time because most people who are incarnated today or many of them um, they want to change the world they want to change themselves so they want to work with these new energies but when people are overwhelmed by these new energies they go into fear and they go into negative vibrations and they pull actually more negative vibrations from the interstellar cosmos towards the earth and that actually makes the future of the earth worse instead of better. Um, so it's very important that even though there is a lot of stuff coming at us and there's a lot of change and a lot of things which are happening which might be uncomfortable, 
not to go into these negative mm. vibrations of anger or fear or paranoia um, or aggression or fighting against the system and, and other things. Because in a way by fighting against the system you're playing in, into its hands or by being paranoid about the system you're in, actually feeding the system. Because by the creation of all these heavy vibrations in our own consciousness, in the earth consciousness, we draw more of these yeah, negative vibrations, heavy vibrations to the earth. So it's very important to, in a way, keep our focus on the higher vibrations, on the things which harmonize with us and which make us more harmonious. And by tuning into those vibrations, um, your energy body can get filled and stabilized by those energies. And it is basically only if your energy body is weakened or empty that it is at its most vulnerable. And so it's a better way not to try to run away from the things which are causing the problems, but to embrace your friends and to say like, okay, of all these energies which are stressing me out, what energies are helping me, which, what energies are protecting me, what energies are helping me grow, and if you invite them in enough by daily meditations or twice daily meditations and all the other vibrations which might be chaotic or heavy or increasing the amount of fear or aggression, they don't harm you as much. So that's a very good way for people to, uh, to deal with it. Basically to, to meditate on yeah, what stars or uh, egregores are uh, nourishing to them. <coughs> Um, yeah, so how to balance a person who is, um, who is suffering from these problems? Um, I said already, yes, the person can, um, can work on themselves through meditation by filling up their energies. Another method we, you can use is basically using the um, Nordic mythology. Because in the Nordic mythology, um, a person is considered healthy if they are balanced between uh, light and dark and between uh, chaos and order. And uh, um, the symbolism is that uh, uh, chaos is represented by fire, which is the, the changing, transforming energy. Order is represented by ice, which is the ordering energy, which is stabilizing. And um, um, the light is seen as the, the power which draws you outside of yourself, which pulls you into the greater cosmos, into greater ideals, while the darkness is going within, centering on yourself, becoming selfish. And there needs to be a balance for you to be a harmonious and balanced person and for you to be able to grow on a spiritual level. If you're totally focused on yourself, you're not getting anywhere. And the same if you're totally focused outward on God or on whatever, you're also not getting anywhere. Because the work needs to be done in yourself, using the energies which come from the outside, which are able to elevate your own energy level. And um, in the same way as, um, like one of my teachers compared it to, to gathering pebbles on the beach, the chaos. So there's always new energies, there's always new interesting things, and you can pick up all these new things, just like you can pick up pebbles on the beach, but at a certain time your hand is full. And with every new pebble you put in, one or more other pebbles fall out. So the hole is shifting, every time you get a new impulse everything is moving, everything is shifting, and everything changes. You never stay the same because of all these impulses, but they don't integrate. And what you should do is more like have a block of clay, and you just slowly shape the clay into a new form and you can add pieces and you can take away pieces but there is a, a basis, a structure which is always the same, which is always stable. And This is why it is very important for people only to in a way look for new things or attach to new things which are from their spiritual cosmos. So which are either from the Arimanic cosmos, from the Luciferic cosmos, from the Satanic cosmos or from the Unfallen cosmos. And also which are attuned to their, um, to their path, which can be magical, which can be mystical, which can be...
Kabbalistic, focused on knowledge, or which can be hierophantical, focused on stability, on harmony. And if you take things which are, in a way, um, yeah, your type of things, they will integrate much more easily and much more quickly, and they won't stabilize, destabilize you, uh, as as it will do if you take other things which are actually not fitting. It is a little bit like um, you go out into the into the forest. You can eat everything you see. But yeah, if you try to eat a tree, you will find that your teeth are not very suited for it and some berries are poisonous. And yeah, if you have the right attunement, the right knowledge, you know what food is healthy, what do you need right now, and then you can um, yeah, improve yourself by taking the right impulses. Okay. So are there questions about this part? some more uh, questions. Oh, I see somebody sending me a message. Uh, ah, yes. Yeah, how to distinguish between mystical and magical and what is helpful. Um, basically, you can state that um, um, magical discipline is focused on your ability to change things um, using your uh, your own energy body. So it's often a manifestation of your willpower, of your manifestation power. And uh, the magical discipline uses the bottom three chakras. So you use your, your, your body, your life force, the powers and the talents which are incarnated within you. Uh, which is your first chakra, you use your second chakra, which is your desire to, to make things different, and you use your third chakra, which is the, your ability to manifest your energy and to shape things into um, yeah, something you like. And what's very important in magical disciplines is often precision and indeed uh, uh, discipline. So, for instance, um, yoga is a very magical uh, discipline in the first couple of steps. So, you say to yourself, like, I won't do these things. I will stay away from sin. I will start to do, to do good things. And I will change my body so that the energy flows, yeah, flow, flow better. And you do this by practice, 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 and self-observation, practice, self-observation, practice. And um, also healing is usually a, a magical discipline. Um, and any, um, for instance, um, any manifestation, uh, anything which comes from your desire, from your willpower, is usually magical in nature. Um, often people who are uh, in the Toltec system, the east wind, so they often have uh, within their aura, the, around their hips, they have an extra layer of energy. Um, they are usually quite good or at ease with, uh, with magical disciplines. If you look towards mystical disciplines, uh, these are about the middle three chakras. So. The throat chakra, where we uh, actually have our, uh, our you know, moral compass of what is right, what is wrong, uh, what am I looking for, what do I know, this is what helps you to attune, to say like, okay, I want to attune to this specific egregore or that type of energy or to angels of knowledge or justice or uh, nature. So this helps you to, to focus yourself, the throat chakra. The, heart chakra is actually the, the chakra which creates the connection if you are working in a mystical manner. So this is really what creates the bridge which allows you to experience the other energies and to exchange energies, to, to communicate. And the uh, third chakra is necessary to, in a way, uh, as a handshake. 
to show who you are, to show what you are, to show what your intentions are. Because if you are unwilling to, to show yourself, then usually the other forces will also hide. So um, to, to work in a mystical manner, you, um, in a way you focus yourself with your throat chakra so that you are attuned to the correct energy. Then you show your, uh, your third chakra, which you open, to in a way show on this level of energy who you are, what you are, what is your desire. And then you open your heart chakra to connect to whatever feels attracted to you. So this is the, the mystical practice. And uh, things like uh, prayer, uh, meditation, um, uh, astral travelings, dreaming, um, and all types of uh, divination, um, like astrology, tarot, um, runes, they, they work in this manner. So also if you're doing a divination, for instance, you want to cast the runes, you think of what is the question, what do I want to know, you put your energy in the stones using your third chakra and then you throw them and you allow the energies which are in front of you to communicate with you through your heart chakra. Um, the Kabbalistical method is um, not so much that you're looking for something new as you're doing in, a, in a mysticism but you're more trying to realize what is already there. It is more of a, a processing or an analysis of the experiences. And for this you use the uh, top three chakras, so throat chakra, third eye and crown chakra. So for instance I've had an experience and first the experience is um, in a way I need to stop filtering it. So my uh, throat chakra will color and twist my experience. So for instance I've had a fight with somebody and I will think like okay I'm right and the other guy is wrong and he's an idiot and he's unjust and whatever. So all my judgments are over here and this is my reality filter. I can only see things according to my nature. And this is the first thing which needs to be removed to have a real good vision, a real understanding. So the throat chakra has to be purified and uh, it has to stop, in a way, guiding you. So it's rather the opposite from uh, the, the mystical process. And um, ultimately, often people shut it down or turn it off so that they become free of their thoughts and free of their programming, at least for a little while. And the processing itself takes place in the, in the third chakra, in the uh, third eye. And in the third eye, you want to expand that chakra so that it can encompass uh, more and more different aspects of the problem so that you can see your own behavior, the other person's behavior, your own past, what happened earlier that day or what you were thinking about and what the other person was thinking about so you can get a total view and often even understand what cosmical powers are involved or how you were attracting or inviting certain events or that a certain argument you're having with a person is actually symbolic of a deeper argument you might be having with yourself. And you also invite higher powers and guides to inspire you, to uh, in a way guide your, your thoughts, guide your knowledge, guide your attention. And this you do by opening the crown chakra. Okay, so these are some examples. Okay, so the next question is, if the spirit and soul are primary, but the flesh and physical world are temporary, what is the role of blood in energy systems of a human? Well, that's a very, very interesting question. Um, what... Um, there is a, a purely energetic circulation 
uh, which goes through the connective tissue, um, through our meridians. This is the, the qi circulation. Um, but and in a way, we this just like blood, uh, meridians can be cut, so you can bleed away your energy, and you can grow weak from from energy loss. In the same way, you can get weak from uh, from blood loss. Uh, blood is actually very much the, the harmonizer, the, the connector. So everything we breathe, we, we smell, all the energies in the air, they go into the blood. Everything we eat, everything we drink, they also go into the blood. And it is basically through the blood that they get connected to the rest of our energetic body, to our energy system. Um, so the blood carries a lot of energies. It carries the energies which we take in from the outside, food, drink uh, and air, but it also carries the energies which we have from the inside and actually in the blood is the first place where the en energies from outside and inside really uh, mix very in intensively. So the blood carries an enormous amount of energy and um, this makes blood magic very powerful, but it's also very powerful in a symbolic level because um, most people can't really cut their energetic meridians to really sacrifice or to give away uh, parts of their, of their energy body that way, but most people can prick a finger or cut a vein so they can give the energy of their body through their blood. Another way to do it is actually uh, um, through semen, through spit, or through breath. Um, but um, spit doesn't carry a lot of energy usually, it carries a little bit. So it, it can be used, but it's more a token amount. Um, you can use breath, but breath doesn't hold the same amount of energy as blood. So, Breath magic, while it can be quite strong, you, and also you really need to develop your uh, lung chakras, which are on the inside of your lungs, to be able to use breath, uh, breath magic. And it's quite powerful, and it can be very effective against diseases, but blood magic is even, even stronger. Um, some people also think of using feces or urine. Um, feces of urine actually doesn't contain a lot of energy um, because most of the energy is actually yeah, yeah, pulled out of it already. Uh, so it is not that strong. Semen, however, is, uh, is also quite powerful. So if you don't want to use blood and you're a man, you can also use semen. And for a woman, if she's lactating, she can use her own milk, which you also consider has a lot of power, just like semen. Um, you use blood magic usually if you're dealing with something which requires a lot of power. So it can be for uh, a healing ritual, if the person is very very sick, or if you're dealing with a relatively powerful being, so something on the level of, um, yeah, of a deity, an angel, uh, really a greater spirit. Um, or something from the opposite side which you want to fight, for which you might also need um, that energy. So, for instance, one of the things you can do, uh, if there's an evil spirit which is bothering you and it is too strong for, yeah, for you to fight, uh, you can use your own blood uh, to um, create um, an energetic sword out of it. So, you can cut your hand or cut your fingers use catch the drops of blood and shape the energy into refine it a little bit and you can shape it into a weapon and this weapon is able to kill and to touch spirits and uh, in the same way you can also in a way use an already existing weapon dip it in blood and thereby it will also become effective against the spirits uh, you can also use it uh, for uh, consecration so, for instance, if you have an altar where you want to pray, um, you can use the blood really to open a doorway between your physical world and the higher reality which you yeah, want to, to pray to. So you can use it for uh, blessing a magical object, for instance, 
and use the blood to create a doorway between this world and the energy you want to flow into the object. So blood is an extremely useful uh, uh, item because it in a way combines all the energies of whatever you've come in contact with of the physical world but also of your of your spirit so it's a natural bridge between the two and also it's a natural harmonizer for the two so and this is why it is so potent in uh, in healing rituals because the blood can absorb a lot of negative energies or diseases or other things so you can use uh, blood to in a way draw disease or problems out of somebody and it can be your blood but it can also be the blood of a chicken which you sacrifice or something like that but I feel it's usually best to sacrifice yourself and not to sacrifice others because it's actually yeah black magic if you force another person to sacrifice if they're unwilling it can be that an animal is willing to to do that or to sacrifice itself and sometimes pet pets do that naturally they will absorb the disease of uh, of their 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 human but yeah try to be careful with that because if you go towards abusing yeah blood magic and also blood magic because there's a lot of energy involved tends to attract spirits which want to yeah feed off that energy so you, if you're doing any blood ritual the space needs to be really clean or very pure or you need to be very precise and very much in control of what you're doing um, so start with normal rituals and slowly build it up using breath uh, or using spit and then slowly work your way up to using blood Oh yes, and menstruation, yes, <laughs> I forgot about that, yes, menstrual blood also contains this, uh, this power, so you can definitely uh, use that, and this, it's in a way also the, uh, the natural way, uh, because women are a lot more sensitive than men, um, they experience roughly two or three times as much as men do because their energy bodies are generally two or three times as sensitive. Um, so they build up a lot of energies from outside. They, their energy bodies tend to absorb all these energies which are coming from the outside much more than is the case with men. And when they're having their period and the blood flows out of them, this blood can absorb and drain away a lot of these energies which they want to get rid of. Uh, so the menstrual cycle is, uh, is a very yeah, good way of getting rid of it. but. It's nice if you can really consciously uh, allow these flings to flow out of you and really uh, use it and not just be annoyed or irritated by it. Um, and is blood rituals used a lot? Is the other question. Well, it is used less and less. Um, blood rituals used to be like kind of the norm. It was normal, pretty much any ritual which was done in. Uh, yeah, a few thousand years ago were blood rituals and that goes for Christianity and yeah, uh, um, Hinduism, um, uh, uh, Islam, um, it was just normal because it was the most powerful energy available so that's what you use. Um, nowadays most people don't know how to butcher an animal anymore. Uh, but they're still involved in, um, yeah, in spirituality. And yeah, now there's like permits and regulations. So if I go to church and slit the throat of a lamb, then probably, yeah, people will at least look at me strangely or arrest me for slaughtering a lamb without a permit or cruelty to animals or, or other things. So we actually have, yeah, started to use different methods. Um, what is much more common now is that people use group, group energy. So what is often done is that a, a person will gather with a group and they will get the group to, um, to do something together, like sing together, pray together, meditate together, visualize together. And by um, doing this, the energies of all the people 
are gathered more or less on the same level and they're often outside of the body. And because the energy is more or less on the same level, it can be collected and because it's outside of the body, it's unprotected. So these are ways to pool energies which can be used for ritual purposes. Um, but it's also important to note that um, while this practice is mostly done in this way in, in yeah, the Americas and Western Europe, that in Eastern Europe and South America and Africa, people more use normal events uh, to gather this energy from. So, for instance, uh, a football, a soccer match or um, uh, something like that. There's a lot of people gathered, they're all focused on the same thing and they're all cheering if a goal is scored or yelling boo if uh, yeah, somebody uh, yeah, fouls another player and also all their energy is focused on the same event, also focused on the same vibration outside of themselves and these are like oases of energies which yeah, can be easily absorbed and used by, uh, by magicians. Um, so uh, this is actually the most common method nowadays. Um, what can also be done for really powerful rituals is that you create a kind of a cascade system. So that, um, for instance, you have one person who gathers the energy of a group, but that person is part of another group. And within that group, one person gathers all the energy of that group, so it becomes like a pyramid. And there aren't very big pyramids, as far as I know, in uh, um, yeah, in, the, the, in Western Europe. But there are very powerful pyramidical structures in the Americas, mm. where they really use these yeah, circles upon circles upon circles, to so that the people at the top have enormous amounts of energy available, and they yeah can do really really powerful strong things with it. And it's kind of a yeah a different way than, than using blood magic, but uh, it's a way a little bit more insidious as well, because the the person who actually goes to a little meditation doesn't know what their energy will eventually be used for. Um, so it can always be interesting if you go to a group to see what happens with the leftover energies. And if all goes well, then usually the person at the end of the evening will either give people back the unused energy or they will send it to a specific place with the knowledge and consent of the group. Mm. So they will say like, okay, I will send this energy to whoever is sick or to the city or to the, to the land or to the trees or to somewhere where there's been a disaster, where they need more support. But yeah, if the energy is gathered but nobody's actually taking control of it, you can bet that either somebody from another place is controlling it or that spirits will come to devour it. Uh, but it's interesting because you're still connected to that energy. It's also karmatically still connected to you. So if I go to a meditation and somebody else uses that energy to, I don't know, make somebody sick, karmatically it is my energy which is making somebody sick, even though it is not my intention. I am responsible for the result. So it is something to be very cautious of what your energy is, is being used for. <clears throat> uh, the next question is, what are preconditions for a prayer to be real? Is the prayer of a child the, the same effectiveness, the same strength as the prayer of an adult? Um, well, usually the prayer of a child will be better. Um, the, there are several re really important things, and one of the most important things is, is faith. Um, that you are able to, to surrender yourself um, wholly, completely, unreservedly uh, to the power you are praying to. And um, what is often the, the case is our personality becomes stronger. Uh, we get more ideas of what we want and what we don't want and what is right and what is wrong. And we tend to only want to obey 
ourselves or a power which is identical to ourselves or obeying us. So as an adult, uh, I tend to subconsciously say like, well, I'm willing to uh, accept the help from a god or to listen to a god if uh, he's good and kind and loving and but I define what is good and kind and loving <laughs> and if the God isn't like the way I want it to be then I reject him subconsciously so often we find that by all our ideas about um, what is right and wrong and what God should be like according to us that we block out the reality of, uh, of God or the goddess or whatever you are praying to. So often you find that by yeah, lacking knowledge, lacking judgment in a way, um, it is much easier to pray. It's also a little bit more risky because you don't narrow the contact uh, as much. But uh, with prayer you tend to attract what is within you. Um, so if there is God within you, then you will also attract the God outside of you and it will connect. But if within you there is only misery and fear and anger and these heavy vibrations, then you can still try to pray to God, but it won't work very well because you will most likely attract yeah, demons or heavier spirits rather than the God you're trying to pray to. Um, so the quality of your own energy and the quality of the energy in your environment are very important because if you want something from a higher vibration to come to you then you need to create space, you need to create room for it to, to enter. So the low vibrations have to leave you. So before an effective prayer you have to do some purification, some harmonization of yourself. Um, it is yeah, like the cup which is already full with, with junk. Um, if you don't empty it, the, the pure nice things can't enter into you either. Um, so these are, are things which are very necessary for prayer. Uh, prayer is easier if you are in a place where the veil between what you're praying to is more thin. So if you can go to a temple or an ancient holy place dedicated to the power you're praying to, it is much easier. And the more often prayer is done in a certain place, the more thin the veil will become. Um, what also happens if already the energies are more present there, by for instance using an icon or a crucifix or something else, so the energies when they come, they can focus, they can build up, they can anchor themselves in our physical world. And such a place where the energy is anchored also makes it much more easy to, uh, to break the barrier, to really connect with, uh, with the reality of it. Um, the purity is also important because if you're praying to an egregore you don't want to pollute it or harm it in any way. And it is the same for other higher powers. They usually you attract something which is more or less of the same vibrational level as you. So if you want to speak to an angel, um, it's easier than to speak to an archangel. And, um, but if you want to speak to, for instance, a person who died or the saint, that's easier again than speaking to an angel. So your own vibrational level generally tells you what will come to you. And um, that doesn't mean that, for instance, the saint is not under control or inspired by an archangel or an angel. Um, and it is often best, if you are praying, to try to attract this higher authority to watch over the prayer process. Um, so what I often do if I pray, I will first go to the highest authority, so if I'm doing a Christian prayer, I will pray to uh, Jesus Christ, who I consider my master and my savior. If I do a nature prayer, I will uh, first pray to the sun, who I consider the, the great harmonizer and the great um, life giver of this solar system. And once yeah, I've appealed to this higher authority, that acts like a little filter or a safety measure so that there is a friendly greater power present who can intervene or help me 
to the rest of the prayer process. And once I've made contact with this ultimate authority I can reach, then I will go for an authority which is on the level of where my problem is. Because um, if I have a relatively small problem, like for instance I have a headache, well, yeah, I can go to Jesus Christ and tell me like, oh, great savior of, uh, of humanity, please take away my headache. But I think he has better things to do than worry about my headache. Um, there are lower levels of spirits, healing spirits, who can, uh, who can deal with that. But by focusing on him, I say like, okay, I want to, in a way, contact healing spirits or healing saints which are also in his domain, which also recognize him as the master. So they're my brothers and my sisters. So out of this pool of spirits, I would like to receive yeah, help from a healing spirit. And this is a good way to build up a prayer. Uh, one other important thing is also to uh, send away whatever you, you pray to or to thank them and to make sure that they know when it's finished. Because you don't want to leave your connection with the higher worlds constantly open. So it's really, you sit down, you open yourself, you pray, you receive the answer or the healing. When that's done, you close yourself again. Because it's really important to work with opening and closing the energy body. If it's open in the wrong circumstances, you just yeah, harm yourself or allow your energy body to become poisoned. Um, so it's really like, like in a way, opening your mouth. Um, you need to let good things in, not bad things in. And it's the same for, for a prayer. So don't do it if your energy is still bad or polluted or the energy around you is still bad or polluted. Um, this can be very tricky because uh, it can be that you had a fight in your house, there's a bad energy, but you need to fix it and how to fix the bad energy. Well. What you do is you go outside, you go to a temple or a church, you pray there and absorb the energy or ask the energy to go with you to your house. And then you can cleanse it and work on it. So sometimes you need to relocate to somewhere where the energy is, uh, is good or is nice or to get away from somebody so that you can, uh, can pray well and that you're, you are in your own vibration. It doesn't mean that you can't pray together but the other person has to be in a very similar vibration because if you're sending out a very mixed message of what you want then generally the answer is like okay well we don't know exactly what you're asking for it's rather confused so yeah. <laughs> so if you can really focus on something together and pray for something together that is great it's very powerful but if you all have slightly different ideas of what is healing or what is helping, then it is better to pray alone or to pray separately or after each other, um, but not to try to combine this energy. Really look at, the, at how, how harmonious the energy is if you do a, a collective prayer or a collective um, um, thing like that. And often if there is a collective prayer, it is best if one person just leads the prayer the other persons just go along with it or support or follow the energy of the person who's, uh, who's the lead prayer. Mm. Ah, what is the esoteric and practical sense of hope? Oof. Well, that is a very, very tough question. Um, there are a lot of, of stories about it. Um, but I think the, the most important one I, I find is the saying that hope is the last thing in the human that dies. Um, because um, hope keeps us focused on, on the higher vibrations, on better things. Um, that we always have this idea that, uh, that there are possibilities to improve, or possibilities to grow, or possibilities to escape. Uh, so hope keeps us active. If we are in despair or in depression, we become inactive and we never get out of it. We stop working, 
and so that's very important. Um, on the negative side, hope can also be deceptive. It can make people foolish, uh, unrealistic, it can make people waste their time or their energies, or actually go against uh, spiritual laws. Um, for instance, if a person is, is poor, then they might hope to win the lottery and they buy a lot of lottery tickets. Um, but ultimately it is karma which decides your nature. Are you good at making money? Are you good at gathering money? Or aren't you? And even if you would win the lottery, if you're karmatically not good at having and keeping money, the money will be gone within two years. Uh, so you can't in a way change nature uh, even though you may hope to. And this is not so much hope, but this is yeah, foolishness. And it's sometimes very hard to distinguish. Um, because hope, in a way, goes for things which are within your path, are within your capabilities. Um, although they might not seem to be within your capability, but some part of you realizes that it is possible, that you can get get it or can get it back and um, it creates a lot of tenacity and perseverance and this tenacity and perseverance is actually what allows us to to grow to uh, to win through our tests and also to grow through various lifetimes because if you have a hope for instance of becoming uh, a great clairvoyant and you practice and you practice and you practice and you don't learn very much but you keep on at it in this life and in your next life you're going to take an incarnation which is slightly more attuned to it and which will have better events and by this perseverance by hoping that you can do certain things incarnation after incarnation you will grow towards it so it is a very evolutionary process but not a very fast process but by uh, this hope, this focus, um, by memorizing and uh, building up this will, this long will which can last several lifetimes, you can ultimately gain control over your incarnations and over the processes and the lessons you will have in your life. Um, so the hope is very much the, the tool by which we navigate ourselves on the, on the flows of energy, um, by attuning ourselves, it's our compass. Um, so it has also a very, very practical sense, uh, of course, because it, it keeps us going, it keeps us moving, it keeps us from, uh, from dis despair. But, um, yeah, it has to be uh, used with, with wisdom. Okay. Oh, well, this is a confusing one. How would you comment the phenomenon that Christianity denies reincarnation? Well, it doesn't. Um, so this is kind of a, 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 a yeah, kind of a misconception. Uh, a lot of things um, were put into Christianity at a later time, at a later age. Uh, if you look at the earlier Christian writings, there is reincarnation. Um, it's only in the later writings that they have removed it. Uh, it's the same with, with celibacy, like celibacy is not a part of Christianity, it was late, put in at a later date. Um, but we can look at the reasons for, uh, for this happening. So, um, one of the important um, ideas behind uh, reincarnation is that in a way the soul is e eternal and the body is temporary and that um, yeah it is the journey of the soul and it changes bodies to to suit its purposes to suit itself so you get the incarnation which is most suited to you um, but ultimately there is no effect of fear and there is no effect of uh, an almighty god because you are guiding your own incarnations. 
So God is not determining everything in your life. You are doing it according to the divine laws which govern the entire universe. But within that set of laws, you're actually yeah, having your own guidance, having your own will. Um, the other part is that nothing which can be done in a lifetime can't be undone given that you have countless of lifetimes. So if you live a life of debauchery and raping and killing, you can say like, okay, well, I may have built up these heavy energies and negative vibrations in this life, but hey, I can reincarnate a million more lives and well, I can do some good things in those other lives, so why not have fun now? <laughs> um, so it's a little bit, um, uh, you could say, a lie to try to force people through fear in, into better behavior. Because if you only have one life, and if you do build up these heavy vibrations, well, and you will burn eternally in hell, <laughs> or um, for thousands of years in purgatory, well, then you'd better not kill somebody. Because, oh my boy, are you going to get it. Um, but it's important to realize that in a way we are building our own hells, we are building our own purgatories. Um, by having these types of incarnations where we focus on these negative vibrations, um, the vibration of our planet goes down, so we will be born into our own filth, if you will, uh, and yeah, you will be uh, confronted again with it in one form or another, because you are, if you have that vibration in you, those are the events or the people which will attract to yourself. So if you rape, maimed and killed, then in your next life there will be also raping, maiming and killing, but you might not be the one doing it, you might be the one suffering from it. Um, so, but yeah, people tend not to think so much about the future, tend to not to realize the, the reality of, uh, of these previous ages. And this is also um, kind of a, a shift in consciousness. So in these earlier ages, where yeah, everybody could remember their previous incarnations and was aware of how their current incarnation would affect their spirit and therefore the next incarnations, uh, people lost that knowledge, they lost that awareness. And um, in a way this is, um, this is a very uh, Atlantean impulse, because the Atlanteans have a very strong lucifercal nature and they want to be free and even if this freedom is um, is an illusion they want to have this illusion of freedom and by having consequences you don't have freedom if every action has an immediate result well that's not very nice because you don't feel any freedom you're trapped by the laws of nature but if you have forgetfulness and there is a distance and a movement in between, so you don't see the relation, you have this illusion of freedom. And the Atlanteans, which are, yeah, most of the humanity which is now incarnated has an Atlantean origin, they have very strongly this, this tendency to want to have this illusionary freedom and who go into this luciferical impulse, into this hallucination of um, the, the spiritual world being different than it really is. And this false yeah, um, uh, yeah, spiritual reality has grown and grown and yeah, has become a very powerful uh, blanket over the whole planet. Um, and this is one of the reasons we remember so little of our previous incarnations. Uh, but yeah, it is also a choice because yeah, we want to have um, yeah, things without consequences. We want look at how we treat nature. We want to have money, we want to use fossil fuels, but we don't want to face the consequences. So we pollute and we create poison and we put all kinds of additives in our foods, but we don't want to realize that it makes us sick and weak and we poison our planet and that the human health, or the health of the human race is actually degrading and we become weaker and weaker um, yeah, in, our, in our nature because we don't color ourselves and we don't harmonize ourselves anymore. Uh, so it's very much through this um, Luciferical impulse that all this knowledge has disappeared, not just from Christian religion but actually from, uh, from most religions. Um, 
and we are being drawn also on the one hand we are being pushed by this luciferical impulse and the other hand we are being drawn by an arimanic impulse of um, knowing everything, controlling everything by um, knowing all the laws and seeing everything as materialistic and controllable and influenced only by ourselves. So we kind of want to shrink our world until we are the masters. And this is also a very powerful impulse which is growing more and more strongly um, as we, yeah, as time progresses in, uh, in this age. And this um, idea, in a way, of ourselves being gods and all-powerful beings is a very strong Arimanic impulse, um, which is, in a way, the, the opposite or the dark side of the, uh, of the impulse of the Archangel Michael. It was basically trying to realize us that we are divine beings and that we have a divine spark in us. Uh, but yeah, that can be twisted into a very dark or materialistic thinking of humanity being the masters of the planet and being able to control and predict everything. So controlling the weather, predicting the weather. Um, yeah, this is all very much this Arimanic impulse. But it's also part of the evolution of the consciousness on this planet. So you can't say like, well, I don't want this Arimanic impulse or I don't want this Luciferical impulse. They're there. but. The important thing is that we have to um, deal with it as best as possible without forgetting that we are spirits and that we have this divine spark and that we are able to harmonize and work also with these luciferical and arimanic powers and try to use them to our benefit rather than, than suffer from them. Um, because this freedom can also help us. It gives us more power, more responsibility and we because our selves are being reflected by the society we see around us and things which happen to us, we can learn more about ourselves. We can accelerate our growth because of this luciferical impulse. And by experimenting with this arimanic impulse, we can find out more about the laws of nature, the laws of the cosmos, and understand more about the divine plan if we don't go into our uh, illusion of power. Okay, well, um, that seem to be the questions for today, so uh, we have some time for, uh, for closing meditation, unless there are more questions, going once, going twice, yes. Where the Arimanic influence is coming from? Uh, yes, well, um, I will go a little bit into the, into the mythology. So the mythology is in a way that um, out of the light, out of the creator, um, yeah, a lot of things came into existence, different angels and archangels, well, archangels, angels and other spirits came into existence and this um, some of them became separated from the guidance and um, oh, I see there's a problem with the call I will wait for a moment <laughs> so that everybody can hear me again okay well okay people can hear me Okay, um, so, and the beings which were, uh, in a way, separated from the guidance of the divine, they went into a great chaos, a primordial 
chaotic sea of events and everything was just disordered and everything was growing in its own way. Um, yeah, but the growth actually went farther and farther away from the light, more and more into, yeah, uh, into deeper and deeper fall. And um, in a way, at the depth of the fall, it was decided that there should be um, structures, there should be laws, and the relatively powerful beings uh, of these lower vibrations said, okay, we will take the responsibility of yeah, the creator, of the god, and we will lead all these lower powers. We create structure, we create laws, the fall stops here, the chaos stops here. Um, so they, in a way, crystallized the universe into, um, yeah, uh, into solid shapes so things could not go any further and things had to grow and evolve upwards again. Um, so this is in a way the, the, the necessity of, uh, of the Arimanic powers. But also the Arimanic powers, they're also the, the lowest of the, uh, the most fallen, uh, farthest away from God of all the beings. And um, the Arimanic powers, they often uh, show themselves for in their desire to uh, control things outside of themselves. So they're very magical in nature and they don't want to change themselves, but they want to change and control everything around them. So, for instance, if you think about people who, who lead, people who make laws, uh, governments, um, regulatory body, bodies, ministries, uh, police force, army, um, these are usually manifestations of the Arimanic cosmos. And in a lesser sense also scientists um, who also want to control everything, govern anything, um, people who make tools. Um, um, so you can see quite clearly that actually since the start of the Industrial Revolution this Arimanic impulse has been growing, has been becoming stronger and stronger in our world. And ultimately also these lower beings, these yeah, kings of the, of the fallen universe, they have to incarnate, they have to manifest themselves and they have to make contact with the hi higher impulses. So for them higher is already the luciferical impulse. And right now the luciferical impulse is very strong so this self-interest, this way of self-improvement is very strong and these Arimanic beings, the leaders, the powers are drawn to this light. So because of this strong luciferical impulse we pull these Arimanic beings to our planet, to our world because they want to absorb the light, they want to learn from the light but on the other hand they also want to limit our freedoms um, because the two powers don't mix very well. So in the in the positive sense, the Arimanic being will turn into a luciferical being. It will absorb the higher vibration. But the risk is that these luciferical beings, which are on of a higher vibration, can deal with more freedom, will get trapped in the Arimanic structure and can no longer grow, can no longer evolve. So what is currently happening is slowing the growth of the luciferical beings and increasing the growth of the Arimanic beings. And ultimately the entire cosmos has to grow. So uh, it is a necessity that also these lower powers, these lower beings manifest on our world. But it is also very important that we don't allow them to control our worlds because then if the world becomes Arimanic then all the higher beings can no longer grow or evolve because there is no more freedom, there is no more individuality, there is just obedience to the law and to the regulations and to the government and to whatever institutions there are. Okay. So does that answer the question about the Arimanic influence? So if, if you look at it, um, um, it, is, it is kind of a cascade. So first you had the unfallen universe and out of that came as the first child or the most light child uh, the satanic universe, the, the nature universe. Mm -hmm. 
and we've had a long time that our, our planet was basically governed by, by nature forces. But then the individuality uh, of the human beings became stronger. We started to separate ourselves from the collective and start to focus on our individual growth, individual development. So the light of the satanic universe, yeah, universe cosmos, attracted the Atlanteans and their luciferical impulse. And now that this luciferical impulse is at its peak, we attract the lower powers of the Aramanic cosmos. And ultimately, yeah, this both the, 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 you know, the Arimanic cosmos has to turn into Luciferic, Luciferic has to turn into nature cosmos, and the nature cosmos has to evolve again and to say, I will not just serve my brothers and sisters on the physical world, on the, on the horizontal level, but I will become part of a vertical brotherhood, of a spiritual brotherhood, and reattune to the angels, to the gods and goddesses, and to the Creator. Hmm. Yeah, I see <laughs> response. Now that is a bit sad. Yes, it is a bit sad. Um, but it's also a matter of perspective. Um, because every, every opportunity can, it can go well or it can go poorly. And if we look at the integration between the, uh, yeah, the, the, the nature cosmos and the spherical cosmos, that did not go well. We did not do very well on Earth in integrating the two impulses and really combining them. Uh, there has been a lot of fighting between the individual humans and the collective and um, that's a pity because that creates a very poor foundation for the future and this should actually be our first step to try to harmonize the relationship between nature and the individual and then the, the, the luciferic impulse will become much more lighter, much more strong, much more connected also to a lighter vibration from where it can nourish itself, from where it can support itself, and then it can also have a stronger influence on this Arimanic cosmos. But yeah, we're trying to transform the consciousness on the planet here. It is not an easy thing to do, but it is a very important thing to do. And yeah, fortunately there are a lot of other solar systems where they yeah, try to help us, try to support us. And we are receiving a lot of inspiration. Okay, so I will do a very short uh, meditation now. So, take a comfortable position. And relax. And ask your guides to come closer to you. Or your power animals. And you do that by opening your third chakra and your heart, by strengthening your own loving vibration. You pull beings which are also loving and have a similar vibration towards yourself. And feel yourself relax more and more as the energy around you becomes better and better. And if you feel that something is no longer fitting in this nice harmonious energy you're creating, just release it. Return to sender. Let it just dissolve in the light which you're attracting. that you have this small 
cosmos around you of nice energies, of light. You can connect to the greater cosmos. And you can start your prayer. So focus first on the highest power in your cosmos, on your master, on your teacher, your guru. And pray to him, O oh Master, you who guide me, who protects me. Please allow my prayer to be heard and granted. Then instead of thinking what you want, just go with your attention to your second chakra and let your spirit speak. This can be emotional, you might feel some pain or sadness or longing, but this is your real need, not your mental need, what you think you need. Let your second chakra speak your true desire be shown. And any change requires our permission. So the powers of light will not alter you or twist you in any way that you do not want and therefore for a prayer to be effective you also have to give your permission so say to the powers those of you who've come to help me with the desires of my spirit to guide me on my path so I may fulfill my destiny in harmony. I welcome you into my cosmos. I welcome you. And then you will start to feel a connection. There's often a warm feeling around the shoulders or the head, sometimes also around the heart. This means that this connection is building between the powers which will answer your prayer, your desire and your own energy body. And allow this connection to deepen. Sometimes it's just a feeling, sometimes you may see images or hear advice. Allow yourself to be moved, to be brought back into balance. So allow your prana tube, which connects all your chakras, open it. Feel that this line between your crown and your pelvis becomes open and the energies can flow back to the chakras where they belong. Your personality can harmonize again. Give them the space to work, to help you. Open your aura. Allow them to flow out of your body into the area around you so that they can also clean the energies or so that you may attract other things into your path. Because prayer is not just about asking in the right way, it's 
also about receiving in the right way. And ask them if there's anything you have to do or should do, either for yourself or for them. Because in the same way as your brothers and sisters help you, you should also help them. Maybe you're inspired to do something for them, or maybe just for yourself, or nothing at all. It's all fine. You can also just receive without feeling guilty. When they're ready, just allow them to leave again and see if there's anything which you don't need anymore which might be useful for them. You might give them a memory or some parting gift, a copy of some experience you had which might be valuable to them. Try to make it a balanced, a healthy exchange where both of you become better. When they have left, thank them. Thank them for coming to you, for their sacrifice of coming all the way down from their cosmos to yours, by going into your small polluted cosmos to bring their light to you. Be grateful of that sacrifice and ensure them that they are welcome to come again so you can build up a more deep relationship with them over time. And you will find that when they're gone, also your own guides will start to leave and that you will go back into your normal world and your own energy, but as a harmonized human, a little bit more of yourself. Well, that was today's lesson. Thank you very much for your questions and your time.